Okay, dimension reduction is another topic we're going to touch on. Um, we don't have time to delve too deeply into it in STAT 220. If you're interested in it, you might take um, or consider taking STAT 420, which is a class called Data Mining and Multivariate Statistics. It's a class that builds on this one. Um, it does require uh, more coding classes and a matrix algebra math class, um, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to use Dr. Thatcher's slides again because, again, um, they're awesome. Um, maybe surprisingly, because I'm using his slides, um, dimension reduction is actually one of my research areas, um, so it's a thing um, that I do. His slides are still better than mine. Um, he's a graphing wizard, which is why he teaches our data visualization course, STAT 320, which is another course you can take once you finish STAT 220. Anyway, um, dimension reduction is the idea that we want to take really complicated data sets and simplify them before we start doing um, our real analysis. Um, so not just cleaning the data, but we actually want to kind of uh, simplify the data to make it easier to understand. Um, so um, one technique we're going to talk about today is called factor analysis. Now you've actually seen factor analysis before if you've ever taken one of those personality tests. Um, the most famous one is called the Myers-Briggs and uh, it's one people like to talk about. Um, psychologists actually prefer to talk about a five-factor model. In both cases though, they take a whole bunch of questions, usually 70 or 100. Um, some of the times they're uh, yes-no questions. The original Myers-Briggs was uh, binary. Others have uh, more options. Um, but in both cases, um, they boil the scores together to get a much smaller set of factors. Again, four factors in the Myers-Briggs, five in the case of the five-factor model, which is literally called that. Um, even the sillier tests, like you might find on uh, Facebook or Instagram, which Hogwarts house are you, is doing a kind of factor analysis. It asks you a whole bunch of questions and it combines that into a single output from the four kinds. Um, as we know, most Truman students think they're in Gryffindor, but really they're Ravenclaws. Um, one factor in uh, actually all of those tests is extroversion. Um, so extroversion is just the idea that um, you're comfortable being around people or um, as psychologists normally talk about it, do you get energy from being around other people or is energy drained from you when you're around other people and extroverts are people who tend to get energy from being in public situations while extrovert, introverts, I'm sorry, um, lose energy in those situations and they tend to get energy from being by themselves. Of course, most people are somewhere in between and in different settings, they might have different responses. So you ask the question different ways about different settings, about larger or smaller groups of people, about different circumstances. Um, but from those, you smush them all together somehow to get a single score. The ACT works like this too, right? You answered um, a whole bunch of math questions and you got a math score. But more than that, some of the questions were about algebra, some were about geometry, some were about trig, some were more general logic questions. Each of those were bunched together, not only to give you the overall math score, but the different subscores within that. What makes what we're talking about today um, different is that um, rather than uh, coming up with the factors ahead of time, which is what you do in those uh, multi-factor tests, we instead let the uh, data fall into their own factors based on which things go together better. So in that sense, it's more like the cluster analysis we talked about before. Again, it's an unsupervised learning model. But instead of clusters, we're now going to define new directions or dimensions based on a series of other items. Another way we say that is we let the data's own commonality um, determine how it works out. Um, so it's sort of a different way to think about data, but the idea that each variable you have could be thought of as a dimension. So in a very physical way, if you think of that Ames, Iowa database we had, oh, I should have pulled it up, but I didn't. Um, we had latitude and longitude, and those are very clearly two dimensions. We can put it on a map, we can make a graph of it. Um, and um, we actually did that back in the earlier assignments, and that's kind of cool. But you can also think of any other variable as another dimension. And so, for instance, we had latitude and we had price or we had number of bathrooms or the quality, which is a categorical variable, but it still defines a dimension. So if I give you a 64 question survey, I've actually asked you to help generate a 64 dimensional space. Now, not in a weird Star Trek kind of way, although that's cool too, but this idea of how each question we ask, each piece of data we collect 
defines a new dimension is what we're going to be thinking about here. Um, so this idea that we're going to simplify those dimensions down to a smaller number is um, exactly what we do. And in matrix algebra, that's literally the mathematics that works behind this idea of dimension reduction, which is why STAT 420 requires um, that. Now, the problem is, as we get more and more dimensions, things just get more and more complicated. Um, so um, here is a graph um, that uh, Dr. Thatcher made. And you can imagine, uh, here's a cloud of points in two dimensions. It has X's and Y's. And you can draw red lines to connect them. If we go into three dimensions, you can imagine some of the dots get closer to you. And you could imagine having red lines still connecting those points. They'd now be sort of you know, red pieces of yarn or red lasers or whatever you want to imagine doing that. If we go to more dimensions than three, it gets really hard to visualize, but the same thing is going on. Um, but what happens is as we get to more and more complicated spaces, these distances start to get more and more complicated. And more than that, it's harder to understand them. So this idea of dimension reduction, we're going to use what's called principal components analysis. And what it does is it tries to identify the directions in which the data has the most variation and that we can get the most meaning from it. So if I show you this graph right here, um, it's pretty easy to imagine that we're going to put a regression line on it. And if we do that, rather than thinking of it as a regression line, we can think of it as a first component of our data. That is, if we summarize all of the dots with the blue line, we've captured most of the interesting information about that. That is what a, re a regression line does. And in fact, you can actually think of regression as a simple form of principal components. We can bring back a second direction by adding a second dimension in, or PC2, a principal component number two, but you can see that it's a lot less interesting once we have the blue line, right? There's less variation there to do that. If we summarize our data just with PC1, we would lose information, right? What's left is what we would call a residual in regression. In this case, we would call it a second principal component. Um, another thing we could think about is we could use geometry to rotate the axis. So instead of having X1 down here, we could instead make this our x1 and bring our whole uh, space down uh, to correspond with that. Again, then x would summarize most of our data with the y being a lot less information for that. Now we now have a new uh, set of axes and principal components, one of which the blue one is super duper important, the red one not so much. Sometimes in practice we call this a football of data because it kind of has that shape. And if you think about how a football is defined, really that one dimension defines it and the other two kind of follow from it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the part where this gets brain melting is that we're not thinking about two or three dimensions, but we're thinking about 60 or 100 or 1,000 dimensions all at once. And we're still trying to summarize it by as few components as possible. In the case of the Myers-Briggs test, we're taking those 100 questions and we're summarizing them with four. So you've actually eliminated 96% of the variables. We've gone from 100 variables to four components or four factors. Did you lose information? Sure you did. We lost the details of those different situations where you might feel um, more energy getting in an extroverted or an introverted case, but we smushed them together to have useful meaning out of four summary things, and we're ignoring what we can hopefully conclude is extraneous. And whether we've gotten it down to four factors or five, or down to you know, one of four categories for which Hogwarts house you have, um, we can actually get that summary. Now, here's a data set we've shown a couple times. This is that IRIS data set. Um, it's from the 1930s. A famous botanist collected it. I think I said it was Mendel, but it wasn't. Oops. Um, who was famous was Carl Pearson, who used this as the basis of factor analysis and also used it to explain correlation. You might remember the correlation is sometimes called Pearson correlation because he's literally the guy who invented it or discovered the formula for it. Anyway, the idea was that there were these three species of irises. And although experts could tell them apart, they looked very similar to non-experts. So the botanist went out and he collected 50 each of the three species, so 150 altogether. And then he did a factor analysis on them. Rather than deciding which variables he thought were important, they used the principal components analysis to identify which ones would be more or less important. 
So you can see on the chart here that with two dimensions, this first one, which he called DIM1, dimension one, it's very easy to separate the green species from the red and the blue. Um, and you can actually uh, not tell the red and blue so differently apart just using the one dimension, although there's a little bit of it here that the red's a little lower than the blue in this first dimension. But when you add in the second dimension, you can now uh, pretty well separate uh, the three species. You might remember in the cluster analysis in the tree, the two species actually overlapped a fair bit. Now, what's crazy about this is that dimension one is actually composed of five different variables chosen from 28. So they measured 28 different things. You can imagine the length of the different petals, the ratios, the width or the diameter of the stem, um, all kind of botany things. And so it's not like dimension one is a single variable. Dimension one is five but they were able to take the 27 or 28 variables and get them down to two factors or two dimensions, each of which contained three or four or five variables. Now, what's crazy about this is that if you think of all the variation in all 28 variables, the first dimension cap captured 73% of that variation. That's an R squared, which you remember from before. That means dimension one contains all the variation that 73% of the original variables would have held. That's pretty cool. You add in the second dimension and it's 22.9%, and now two dimensions are capturing 96% of the variation across all of these different variables. Again, each one of those are things about the pistils and the stamens and um, all of those things that they measured, but they were able to quickly summarize and find which ones were important. Now, it's sort of cool that Carl Pearson was able to do this in the 30s by hand with that many vari variables, but we can now do this with thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of observations and you know, hundreds or thousands of variables. We can use PCA like this in order to get uh, the summary statistic that we have. Now, one technique that we can use is once we've done this, we can now do the other techniques based off of that. So we can graph in the two dimensions rather than the 28 or the 1,000. We can do clustering or regression on these components and we can make predictions based off of that. Because the idea is these new variables are now smushed, they're combined into these principal components. Now, one example I wanna talk about here in a little bit of depth is facial recognition. So you can imagine I take your picture and let's say I'm doing that with an eight megapixel camera, which means that I've taken a picture that has about eight million pixels. Now, each of which is a little colored dot. So it's actually more than eight million uh, data points because each pixel has a color associated with it. And, you know, we put those together to make photographs and you know that more megapixels, more pixels makes a better picture. And if we wanted to do that, we could then take your picture, put it into Google Photos, or put it on Facebook, or put it on Instagram, and it'll try to guess who you are. And it's sort of amazing that when you put it into Google Photos or Facebook, it says, hey, that's Cousin Bob. And surprisingly often, it's correct, even though it does it very quickly. Now, these same things are at the airport, right? As you go through the airport, they're taking photos, they're taking videos all the time. And they take that picture and they try to match it up against the terrorist watch list or the no-fly list and they try to find those. And they have the same thing at the courthouse in Washington, D.C., in Manhattan, anywhere you're worried about that. Um, even at sports arenas, they have those same kind of things. Now, those work in the same way. They take your photograph, they have all those pixels, and it tries to uh, figure out how can we quickly identify whether or not that's a person. Now, um, it splits it up into these components and as we look at those components, they actually look sort of weird. Here is a set of things. We call these eigenfaces. Um, eigenvectors are the things we were talking about before. That's a German word. Um, and it's used to describe these. And what you do is you can add together these components to make faces. Now notice they start very general. And in fact, the first three eigenfaces um, are actually very specific. Um, these actually deal with lighting. So rather than um, particular facial features, this is side lighting, this is front lighting, and this is back lighting. And then these are different features. And again, each of these photographs by themselves look kind of creepy. Um, if you go on Wikipedia, you can find these uh, same pictures. 
and the rest of them can be added together to make a face. And it turns out if you have a whole bunch of them, you can actually very accurately identify people. Um, again, the Wikipedia page has sort of a cool page about that. So um, here is the picture from uh, Wikipedia. And you can see after we uh, take out the three sort of uh, false photos, the ones that are for lighting, um, the first one looks pretty, pretty blurry. We add in 2, 5, 10, 20. And by the time we get up to about 80, it starts to look like a face. And as we add more and more, it gets sharper and sharper. And with 1,000, 1,071 is sort of a number we use um, a lot. Um, with that, you actually can get a pretty um, accurate picture that looks like um, a guy. Now, again, we can't use all the data. So you imagine I take your picture, your 8 million, uh, 8 megapixels, and we cut out the things that aren't your face. So we might get it down to, I don't know, 100,000 uh, pixels. And 100,000 is still a lot, but it turns out we can get it down to 1,000 of these eigenfaces, each of which is a set of um, other things, add them together, and we get the picture um, out of those. Um, again, even by the time we're at 150, that's a pretty low res picture, and you could use that to make some distinguishing characteristics. Now, you might say, gosh, well, 150 or 1,071, that's still a ton of dimensions, right? If we were talking about a thousand dimensional space, you'd say, gosh, you're back in that Star Trek episode. But it turns out that if you're given a million photographs, each with eight megapixels, each having a thousand eigenfaces, a thousand is way fewer than eight million. And so we can find that terrorist or that person on the watch list or Uncle Bob or Cousin Bob in your photo way faster than we could have before. Google's doing it, Facebook, Instagram are doing it, and you know they add to their picture bank all the time. One reason Facebook or Google Photos can do it so quickly is because they aren't comparing you against the whole list of the entire terrorist watch list. They're comparing it against your friends um, and the people that you are linked to on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. So it says, hey, is this Uncle Bob? Now it has a much smaller group that it's pulling from. And again, that's with a thousand faces. We can get to this accurate. Um, the best uh, desktop computers can easily do 64,000 faces. And my guess is probably the ones at Google headquarters or IBM headquarters or the ones the government uses, they can probably do a few more than that. So that's how they can very quickly identify someone on the no fly list, very quickly out of a bank, out of the millions of photos that would be submitted to that uh, database. Now, whether or not this is awesome because you can identify Uncle Bob in a photo, or it's frightening because now the government can pick you out at the airport, you know, it depends what you're thinking about. And um, I think, again, this idea, it's literally taking the same idea, this football of data, to try to get the summary that is most useful out of the least amount of information you have, right? And you can see how, um, you know, uh, Carl Pearson could do this with you know, 20 or 30 variables for a data set of 150, although it took him a long time to do. But with the rise of computers and the increase in computing power, it's easy to imagine computers doing this a lot more quickly. So the idea um, is also done in voice recognition. It's what's done um, with fingerprint scanners. So the same thing that's done with eigenfaces here is what's done with your fingerprints on your phone when you uh, do a thumbprint scanner. Um, again, facial recognition, um, Voice recognition does it with a voice print, so it's a different kind of eigen, now it's an eigen sound. Um, but again, very quickly, we can piece together very complicated things using these uh, breakdowns. Again, it's not comparing each pixel one at a time, but rather these components, these factors that are based out of um, lots and lots of variables. Again, whether this is awesome or amazing kind of depends on which science fiction movie you think we're living in. Um, and hopefully it's a good one. All right, um, there we go.